I also thought I would maybe do just a little bit in the way of uh, ground, ground rules about what our module tonight is and what it is not. Um, we think it's an opportunity, we intend for it to be an opportunity to present a very distinguished panel of our uh, community citizens who uh, you'll find out are very impressive people. We'll introduce them in just a moment. And um, we, we want to present them to you uh, and show that, uh, you know, how dedicated and effective leadership can shape a community for the benefit of its citizens. That's what we brought here for you tonight, for this class. What tonight's module is not is a political forum in which we bring up, you know, controversial issues, and God knows we all know what they are, and they're in, in our lives all the time. But we're going to do something a little bit different tonight, just talk about how leadership in our community, and with fine people like our panelists, can make a big difference in the community. There's plenty of opportunities for those other issues to be discussed with these people and with ourselves um, at another time. So that's kind, of, uh, that's kind of what we had in mind. And maybe even afterwards, um, if you wanted to talk about things with them uh, at, at 8.30, then we can do that. So our panelists tonight, let me briefly introduce them, and then we will have them each uh, introduce themselves and give a little bit more background on who they are and what they do. So we've got, well, I've just got this, I think, in alphabetical order. We've got Sherry Jerome, who is our representative, House, Di House District 16. 25. 25. 25. Excuse me. 16 down here. <laughs> <laughs> I might have put that wrong on the. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, it's nice that so many people know that it's House District 25. Um, uh, Pete Jacobson in the middle up here. And Peter's been involved with our community for so long and in so many different ways and has a very uh, unique perspective on local districts, and so we're going we're gonna to grill him on that a little bit and allow him to talk about that and how uh, many of you are already involved with that. And uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit. We've got Jeannie Nicholson, who is our state senator. From that would be District 16. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, we have Linda Rockwell, and Linda has been involved with our community in various uh, ways uh, whether it's MALT, whether it's the Democratic uh, uh, Party uh, chairman for Jefferson County, she's been involved and is still involved. And then we also have, the last but certainly not least, Don Rozier. And Don is our county commissioner with, what, what district are we? Three? three. District Three. So he takes special care of us up here in Evergreen and down in Conifer as well. So let's just allow you all to introduce yourselves and you know, I apologize about the heat in here. It's a little, a little warm. Is it just me? Door. Door. Fantastic. Yeah. Maybe that will cool they us off. They said if somebody seat. complains, I need to. Okay. okay. Linda? Yeah, you want to talk more about myself? Yeah. 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 The library? No. Yeah. I've lived in Evergreen uh, a long time. I built a silver house over by El Rancho in, in 1982, and I still live there. Um, and I've done a lot of things in Evergreen. Probably my most proud thing is um, is calling the first meeting that resulted in the Mountain Area Land Trust. And I, I'm currently on the board of the uh, uh, Jefferson County Public Library. And I was appointed to the board to a three-year term in 2008 and reappointed uh, in 2011. So. I most I, just a few months ago I finished up a, a two-year stint as the as the chair of the board, and it's quite astounding how much more time I have. <laughs> <laughs> since since I, 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 I'm the, just the Indian, not the chief, you know. So um, I'm not as busy as I used to be. I used to have like 18 irons in the fire, and that's one thing I've learned. Is, it's not that I'm slowing down; it's that I think I've gained some perspective. Because there was a time when I was going from here to there, you know, and I had my calendar in 15-minute increments, and no more, you know. This morning I baked bread. Uh -huh. yes. Wow. You know. <laughs> it's a good thing to do. You know, the house is cold, you know. Yes. I put that in my official bio. <laughs> yes. I, I, I became a grandmother for the first time on the 6th of August. And it's oh, congratulations. Quite amazing. Wait, uh, uh, yes, yeah, 
babysat for the first time and we discussed these questions at great Genies. I grew up uh, in Denver. I'm a Denver native and um, my father uh, was in the legislature when I was growing up, so I grew up in politics. And um, I moved to the mountains when I married my high school sweetheart. Um, we both grew up in Denver, but uh, we both wanted to live in the mountains. And so um, we said, instead of spending the weekends in the mountains like our parents did, we would just spend all of our time in the mountains. And uh, so we've lived in three different mountain communities. We started in Gunnison, moved to Winter Park, and now we live in Gilpin County. And um, our property is um, just west of Golden Gate State Park, um, borders the state park. My husband built our house out of beetle kill logs mm -hmm. and um, put them up himself. You know, some people say when they uh, that they have their house built, they mean someone else built their house, but actually we built our house. And um, we have uh, two sons and a foster daughter. And I have two granddaughters, and they're just a tiny bit older than Linda's. Mine are one and three, so we have a good time comparing notes on being grandmothers. Excellent. Oh, I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot to add one more thing that um, Commissioner Rozier would think was strange if I didn't mention. Um, I was a county commissioner for eight years before I ran for the you got to be proud of that, Gene. I am very proud of that. <laughs> Best job, wonderful job, in Gilpin County. Yes. In Gilpin County. Yes. Okay. Uh, Pete Jacobson. I've lived in Evergreen since 83. Yeah. I, um, some of the questions that I was given, I have um, a degree from DU in broadcast journalism. Wanted to be a sports anchor, never got there. My first job out of college was as a press person for a Republican senator in Colorado in 78. Out of that campaign, I got hired to be a copywriter for Bush for President, Bush won. A Republican, obviously, but I was involved in a lot of presidentials. Pete Wilson for Senate California. A lot of high profile races for a number of years. And in the midst of all that, I was kind of said, Jacobson, you do this stuff nationally in other places. How about Evergreen? And I, I took the bait from A.J. A. Johnson, who was on the Park and Rec Board in the 70s, was elected to the Park and Rec Board in 94, met Peggy's husband, Peter. Was, I was the last of the 12-year guys, because term limits kicked in the middle of it. I was on the board from 94 to 2006. Yay. And uh, for a long time, was on the water board at the same time, the Metropolitan District. And in 1994, after I got elected, a guy named Bob Cardwell. Uh, who many of you know, lived at the end of the ridge, the end of Keystone Drive, and he said, hey, the Lutheran property, which is right, was right here, is coming up for sale on the park and rec board. You guys ought to think about building a park there and buying that property and starting all this stuff, because as many of you know, maybe you don't know, the old road to Denver was Oregon Parkway. And then what, 96, I think, the, uh, the four-laner was built, and Evergreen Parkway, and all of a sudden we had this very unique piece of property, the roundabout, the RTD lot, in this end of it, and people, Bob's idea was, like, is totally his idea, that we should have a park there. And that started, the conversation started in 94, and we finished the third bond question, which all the bond questions at Evergreen, for Noble Meadow and the building, the, the rec district here, and this Noble Meadow and the ball fields at Marshdale, and building a pocket park down on um, uh, Al Pernal here, with those little parks. All that kind of started in 95. And I take a lot of credit for that. It's kind of being myself and four or five others kind of led the whole charge. And my political background was very beneficial to that. Along the way, I did many other things, and I'd like to say I'm a retired volunteer now. <laughs> I was a volunteer from 94 to 2006. I had gray hair from my girls, I think, not from that. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm now, uh, I ran a trade association for a number of years. I'm actually looking for work right now, so I'm going to hire anybody. I'd love to talk to you afterwards. I'm a, a governor's, government affairs specialist, project manager type person. I've lived here for a long time, and I cherish this community. I've been in every state capital of this country. I've been in all 50 states in my career, and I still love coming back here. And I will continue to be involved in this community at one level or another. Probably more of just kind of the watchdog role. Right now, I'm very concerned about the activity at the lake. It's being loved to death. <laughs> and uh, last week with Chile, uh, the Chile, all the things they do at the lake are great. <clears throat> just too much going on that we need to find a balance. I'm a little discouraged that the rec district has been couponing in Arvada and Aurora for 
little granules at the lake. I think that's true on a little bit of problem. But I think that will correct itself this winter. And I just kind of watch this stuff. I'm not involved as much as I used to be, which is fine. And I'm a uh, 14ers, and I ski a lot and I ride my bike a lot. So maybe I'll see you on the road someday. But I'm glad to be here. And uh, congratulations for doing this. I was in the second class of leadership ever in 1997. The class project we had rocked rocked the leadership of the chamber at the time. We did a feasibility study about incorporating Evergreen, making it a town. And, and we had no we had no bias that we were going to do it. We wanted to do an empirical study about what would that what that would look like. And in 1998, if you had a three hundred thousand dollar assessed home, your taxes would have been up eighteen hundred dollars for no appreciable increase in service. So and I think all due respect Commissioner, I think Evergreen will remain unincorporated until you know, Wheat Ridge and Lake Wood and all those other kind of cities within Jeff Bell start driving policy that we don't like and hopefully they'll never happen. But the special districts are how we protect ourselves. The water district, we'll talk about that later, but the water district and the fire district were created in the 50s by names you know in this town. Hal Davidson, Tupper Mills, Anderson's Market, you know, Esco, Bud Clark, all those folks. They had a vision. And Ross Grimes tried recently at 87 years old to start the water district in the 50s and those guys had a vision about what this community was going to be. And I was thinking about Bergen Park, Thomas Bergen, when you go down to the county commissioners building, one of the first county commissioners in Jeffco in the 1880s, and that kind of, mm -hmm. time in the, the days, was some up here. And we've always had a unique perspective. And if we could create one new special district, which we can't procedurally and constitutionally, I wish I were going 20 years ago, but created a planning and zoning special district. With all due respect for the commissioners, there's a few things up here that we wouldn't have liked to see done. We can't do that. And, you know, things, times have changed. I'm talking too much. Anyway, that's kind of my view of the world. <laughs> <laughs> the commissioners doing a great job. I'd rather be an executive than a state legislator. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> in that gold dome right now, there's some crazy stuff going on yes, down there. there. I don't know if it's the water. I don't know if it's the. It's the new gold is. leaf they're putting on there. It's some weird stuff in there. It is. It is. It is. Well, good afternoon. Uh, evening right now, Don Rose, your Jefferson County Commissioner. And all I got to say is if you see boats that have sunk in Evergreen Lake, you know who to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> I think they snuck in there and did that. It's a great honor for me to uh, be back here again. Um, I spoke last year and um, it's is a great opportunity. I'm a third generation Coloradoan, um, born and raised in Arvada, um, product of Jefferson County Public Schools, and I went to Colorado State University. I received my degree in civil engineering, uh, water resource engineer, engineering. I practiced after 25 years. I still am a registered professional civil engineer. I still try to dabble in that as, as much as possible, but I have to tell you, being a commissioner is a full-time job. Um, I actually um, put in probably 12, 14 hour days. Um, when you factor in all weekends and everything else, if you don't do that, you are not doing what you need to be doing. It is a full-time job, no, no matter what anybody says, right Jeannie? It is a full-time job um, that's out there. Um, I'm married. I've been married for, uh, coming this December, I'll be married for 25 years. I have three children. I have two that are in college. I have one in graduate school, one who is uh, a sophomore, and then I have one who is still in high school, and he's a uh, junior this year at Dakota Ridge High School. I live in a uh, south part of Canyon, so I, I, I migrated south, but not too far. Um, just enough to get away from all the relatives and, you know, family. Uh, so I can be myself, right? Are you unincorporated, Jeff? Of course unincorporated, Jeff. Stay unincorporated. It's a great thing. Um, way more flexible. Um, I served for eight years as chairman of the Community Development Advisory Board uh, in Jefferson County. That uh, really was my introduction into uh, more of government operations at the county level in Jefferson County. Prior to that, with being a uh, water resource engineer, I also worked on large master plan communities uh, throughout the nation. Um, I worked and built uh, country club communities, uh, not only throughout the U.S., but also internationally, and was involved with planning and zoning and entitlements um, here in Colorado, but elsewhere. So it really uh, allowed me to get in and, and to get my feet wet and understand how different municipalities, how different cities and counties and states do things. 
uh, how they how they look at entitlements and uh, and the processing. I jumped into the race because I felt that uh, somebody needed to challenge the incumbent. I felt that there was a, a, a niche that I was perfectly suited for as a business owner uh, to go in and, and to say, hey, I can contribute. And I promised on the campaign trail um, that I would put aside and get rid of my businesses, that I would concentrate full time on being a county commissioner. I don't take any other pay anywhere else. I get paid for a county commissioner, and that's it. Uh, that hurts with two kids in college. Uh, so it'd be free. <clears throat> and but I have to tell you, it's it's very rewarding. Not monetarily, but rewarding because I get to come in here and talk to individuals such as yourself. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Fantastic. Let me just before Sherry introduces herself, Mel. Yes. Mel, didn't we have an award in February that went to our Leader of the Year? Yes. yes. Sherry Jarrell. Yeah. Leadership Evergreen. Yes. Yes. Leader of the Year. And, and she was named the Land Steward of the Year by Mount Mary Lincoln. Um, I'll be quick so we can get to your program. Uh, you've got, you read the bio. The only thing that I'm doing that I don't think is in the bio is, um, you brought up the dome. Um, because, because of my background, um, and, and I, I know practically everybody in the room, and because of my architectural practice, I've been um, drafted to a lot of um, RFP processes when we're doing work down at the Capitol. So I selected the, I was part of the group that selected the architect and the contractor for the renovation of the dome. We're also, um, going to restore the House Chamber and the Senate Chamber to their original ceilings. There are fall ceilings in there, so they're going to go up for well, about 20 more feet. So we're going to put the real ceilings back in, we're going to strip all the cork off the House um, interior. So I was on the selection committee for that, and then most recently we just had the selection committee for the redevelopment of Capitol Hill. And this is going to be a really interesting thing because this is something Mayor Hickenlooper started when he was mayor, um, wanting to revitalize and um, um, reinvigorate the neighborhoods around Capitol Hill. So we have a master planning process that we are going through right now, and I'm sitting on that committee. And um, Mayor Hancock and the governor have been working hand in glove to take that through, which is actually going to be great because a lot of us that are in the construction industry, now I can't do any state work because I told people I wouldn't. But there's a lot of other people in the mountains that are in the construction industry that are going to benefit from that. Plus the fact that we're going to revitalize one of the most important areas of downtown. So thank you very much for inviting me, and I'll just be quiet. Well, Trader Joe's is going, right? There's four Trader Joe's. Woo! 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 How about my Evergreen? Really? Did you all that? Did you all know that? That's next year's project. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the module, uh, the goals, and the, sort of the setup that you were given at the beginning of, of, of your class um, was fairly generic. We, we talked about how we get into current political leaders, obviously we're doing that, um, becoming involved in the political process, candidacy, elections, laws, regulations, initiatives. Well, specifically in this module, we seek a better understanding of how leadership qualities and actions play a role in the established political processes and in the personalities of these types of individuals who take on these positions of leadership in our community. So we're just hoping to be able to glean what we can from these accomplished people. And We're going to throw some questions out there and don't really have it very structured. So. Well, depend on them to maybe step forward when they hear one that they like, and for other people to also to chime in on that. So my first question is, what influenced you to get into politics? Anybody like to take that one? On? I'll start. With All that. right, Jean. What influenced me was growing up in a family that was politically active. Um, I think the best way to describe it is a story. Um, I called my best friend that I've known since we were six months old and I told her that I was running for the state senate and instead of saying 
oh, that's great, I'll help you. Or because she's a nurse like me, um, saying, I don't understand why you're leaving this profession that you love. She said, well, I'm not surprised. And I said, well, why are, why are you not surprised? And she said, well, don't you remember when we were four years old and we asked your mother if we could campaign for your father? And she said, you're too little to cross the street, but I'll give you some literature and you can walk around the block. And so we did. <laughs> and what I think is most interesting about that story from my perspective is that I don't remember doing that and she remembers it very clearly. And I think it's because it would be like asking me what did I eat for dinner when I was four years old on July 31st. I mean, it was such a normal way of life for my family that um, I didn't think that walking around the block with my dad's literature was anything remarkable at all. Um, so that probably is how I got into politics and I like to joke and say that I was probably registered in the prenatal period. It's just a part of, <laughs> part of how I grew up. Um, gave my first speech in fourth grade, and it was uh, to uh, explain to my colleagues why they should vote for the president in my political party. And it was the only time my mother said that I refused to go to school the next day because most of my classmates voted for um, the wrong person, according to me, and in protest, I wasn't going to show up for school the next day. I was about nine years old. Um, and then the other reason um, that I was motivated is because of my background in public health nursing. And I felt that I was not able to influence the process in the way that I wanted to from the out, what I call the outside. Um, going down and testifying didn't seem to be um, having a strong influence on the policies that I thought should change in public health and health care in general. And I decided that I really just needed to run for office so that, quote, I could be on the inside of the circle and see if I could have more influence that way. Fantastic. Who else? Well, I'll jump in, as I said earlier. I don't really, I did politics for career. Um, but I don't see myself in Evergreen as being politically involved as far as the rec district and the water district. It was more, it seemed like the right thing to do at the right time. I was excited about it. We are making, you know, Noble Meadow passed in 94, which is a bonnet question. Just preserve on the other, the west side of the highway here and that kind of struggle process. But um, it's more about leadership, I think. That's what we're here about tonight. And it's just, it's exciting to be involved with the local stuff here. I'm not going to talk about my career stuff because it's not germane to what we're doing tonight. But um, there's, Evergreen's just a cool community and there's a lot of people involved. And, and <coughs> yes, I was involved in special district stuff. It wasn't politics, but you know, I met a lot of people. I mean, Hank Oliver and a lot of, you know, original people from Evergreen. And it was just a fascinating experience. And I guess it is political when you're asking people for bond questions and, you know, raising their mill levy and whatnot. But uh, I just think, Evergreen's a pretty cool place. I don't really feel like it's a Republican or Democrat place. It's open space and parks and all that's not political. And I'm not, you guys do great things. This is what I'm really talking about is Evergreen and, and, and the leadership and the things we did. There was a lot of brain damage, a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings. Oh my God, bond questions and negotiating deals and last minute deals. But I, I just got involved with the special with, with Evergreen stuff because I thought it was the right thing to do and I felt like it made a difference. For me, it was, uh, as a business owner, as somebody who had gone through an entitlement process, uh, gone through the whole government, um, as somebody would say, government red tape, and that, that whole process, looking at all the regulations for a business owner. And not only as a business owner, but then as going out to try to look at land entitlements, I just, it was overwhelming uh, to see what it cost with no guarantee in the back end as far as zoning with, um, you know, waiting to, you know, spending millions of dollars with um, no guarantee of your plans or anything being approved, looking at being very difficult to even get a sign for your business to hang outside, um, and just the process, the multiple applications, the months and months of waiting for something that should be as simple as a sign, um, to me was just absurd. Uh, and these owner's regulations, I just said, you know, enough's enough. Um, somebody has to get off the sidelines that has experienced this from the business side and say, hey, I'm going to jump and I'm going to change. 
I'm going to change the process, I'm going to get involved, and I'm going to hopefully right this ship. And, uh, you know, the first, the, the first group I met with, and it was the first group who called me, it was a sign issue, and it was the Conifer Chamber of Commerce. And as you can tell, there were some changes going on. So, um, I, we've been very positive. We look at economic development, looking at business, and looking at, at the county as a whole, not just little individual bits and pieces. So for me, it was the entire county, how we all work together, and in the business environment. Do you want to huh? I don't care. <laughs> That's fine. I, I got involved because at the time I went to my first caucus in 1984, there were not, there was not one elected official who was a Democrat in Jefferson County. Mm -hmm. And I was real active in <clears throat> ABLE at the time, and at least once a week I either testified before the Planning Commission or before the Board of County Commissioners, and I, I began to feel like um, I was, what do they say, you know, hitting my head against a wall. What was the name of Enable is the Evergreen North Area Balanced Land Use Effort. It's still, it's still in existence. They still meet like the second Thursday of the month or something like that. Um, they're still reviewing a, a lot of uh, applications for development. So I just said, well, I'm going to fix that. <laughs> you know, I, there, there has to be a choice, you know, and I, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. If both parties are strong, you have better candidates. And, and better elected officials. Because if you, if you have, if you're skewed, and, and like in Adams County, look at all this stuff that's go, been going on there. I mean, if you read the paper about all this corruption and stuff like that, they're all Democrats. And, you know, and it's, it's a one party county, at least it used to be, and it allows the people who get elected to get away with everything. So, if, but if you have the balance, if you have two strong <coughs> parties, you, you end up with a lot better elected officials because every one of them knows they could lose to their, to their opponent in the next election. So they, it, keeps them, it keeps it clean. Um, that's why I got involved and I think I've succeeded. <laughs> we now have a lot, of, a lot of balance in Jefferson County. Um, I, uh, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it wasn't Rob, it was Tony yeah. Gramsis. Um, but uh, I, 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 I'm an overcompensating introvert. I, 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 it's true. If you do the Myers, Myers Brig, you know, you, and, it, and it, that's what I am. Um, I really like policy. I really hate politics. I really hate politics. And, and what we're seeing. Uh, is it just reaffirms my my uh, dislike of it, but it's a necessary evil. The system does work. Um, when George Washington, after well, when he was in politics, you know, they always talk about how in those days um, when they'd have an election, they'd always have a keg of rum there, and if you'd vote for me, you'd get a, a, a drink. Washington did the same thing. I mean, we can't. The, the system is really. By and large, it's the same as it's always been, but it works. Um, but Cincinnatus w uh, Society was a group of, it was based on the, uh, the, the Greek philosopher that said every person needs to put down their plow and um, give time to their government and then spend that time and then go back and pick up their plow. And I believe in that. I mean, I'm not, uh, politics isn't something I will do forever. Um, I'm, I, there are things that I appreciate working on. I love numbers. I love policy. Um, but it's probably the policy that keeps me involved. But it, it was Tony Gramsis, and I don't know how many of you remember Tony, but um, he, he was a very special person. And, and the first time my husband and I became involved in politics in Jefferson County was in 1983 when we had a, in those days you used to host a coffee for uh, a candidate, and it was when Tony was first running for his first house seat. So that was it. I think we can probably all agree that in these days we're in a period of hyper partisanship. And uh, so the question is what leadership characteristics do you think it takes to run for office 
in today's environment? Well, there's theory and there's reality. <laughs> 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 I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's all about building consensus and being willing to compromise. And if you really believe in something to your core, you stick with it. But if you don't, I mean, you have to, you have to, you have to pick and choose your battles, I think. And um, but this is about running for office, not holding office. Well, yeah. It's a little uh, bit. Uh, I think that's it's, a good there's point. a little bit of it takes nuance. Takes problems. Well, see, I, I'm like, I'm like Sherry. I would love to be a governor or a senator, but I could never throw myself. I never said that. Well, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but to run for, I, I like, I'd like to be in office. I'd like to be in office. I don't want to campaign. The campaign has gotten so ugly. I worked for a guy named Wayne Allard. He was a very mm -hmm. conservative guy, but very squeaky clean. And I mean, it's it's unfortunate. He's a very good man, an honor man, and he worked hard. And he was misunderstood. He's a lot of open space stuff, and he was kind of slotted as a very conservative guy when he really wasn't that conservative on a few things. But um, I don't know. It it it's tough. You got to really be willing to throw your uh, you know your whole life open. And if you smoke pot when you're 18 years old, you're going to hear about it. And, you know, it's all right for you and your, your wife. What about your care. kids? Well, I know, but, you know, but still, I mean, there's things like that. I mean, you know, what you do about what I was thinking about running for office. I got recruited to run for state senate way back in the day when Bo Calloway was chairman of the, of the Calloway Republican Party at that time. Were you going to run against Sally? No, Sally was before Sally got recruited. It was like back then, I think they were getting paid 17 grand a year. Now you guys get a big 30 grand a year. Yes. Right? It's big. It's big. I was going to talk to Don about shooting Sally. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. It, it just, it, it's just tough now, but if you really believe in something, you really believe in it, you think you can achieve something that's great. I mean, I, again, my experience for tonight has been local stuff, and I really enjoyed doing that. It's different than the stuff we confront with. And it's off. I mean, when I was Allard State Director, I had more problems with Mrs. Allard trying to go after the press than the senator. I, mean, she, I used to pull her back a few times because I mean, these people write stuff, they don't do the research, and it's very tough to be a candidate. So you're right, Linda, I didn't really answer the questions and expect about, to the extent of running. Yeah, I think it, well, you segued into it. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's tough. It's, I mean, you gotta, I mean, when Bo Calloway's recruiting me to run, I said, so let me say, I quit my job, I get 17 grand a year, you want me to put in 15 or 20 of my money to run. I'm like, really? <laughs> Man, this, this does not work for me. I had little kids then and then. But it's it's tough, and I admire what you guys do, because, I mean, the legislators, they say, we have a 100-day session, January 1st, 120, excuse me. But, I mean, it's not it's not wall-to-wall -wall through the calendar year, but, I mean, you guys work really hard during the session, but then you do... You know, interim committee meetings and all kinds of stuff. It's, 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 it's interesting. You, you have to have, you, you, if you're going to run now, you just have to know you're going to take shots if there are these guys left. I mean, it's only one for the water district. And it, it, I admire people that have the cojones to do that because you just get beat up. And some of it's legit, and half of it's just innuendo and, and posturing. And it's brutal. It's really unique now that with social media. Because anybody can be a blogger, anybody can say anything, and it's immediately out there. Um, you know, looking at the recall that happened last night, and just looking at the multitude of blogging going on, and, and reading what people say about other people, and this and that. Um, it, you know, it, in most cases, it's opinion, and you have to have a thick skin. You really do, and it really requires you to to keep your focus because it is so easy to get caught up in what somebody is saying about you that is absolutely positively wrong, false, yeah. and, and inaccurate. And they're going to try to blow you up. They're going to try to get you upset. They're going to try to trip you up. It's a game that's being played all the time. And it's you have to keep your focus. But at the same time, you have to be able to articulate your point. If you are arguing, whether it be in the, on the floor of the House, the Senate, or in, in, in the hearing with the county commissioners, if you say something and somebody challenges you on it, you better be able to back up with stats and examples of what you are doing. And it, uh, too often it's, whether it be Republican, Democrat, whoever, it's more of a party position and not that person's position. And when pushed, they can't back up why they believe what they believe. So then you have to question what kind of leadership, why are they running? Did they lose a bet? That's what I tell everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> 
Mm -hmm. but, I, you, you know that, oh, you want to say? I was just going to say that, um, kind of piggybacking on what Don is saying, um, I think you have to have a vision. I think you have to have a specific vision of what you want to achieve. I think you have to be able to communicate that vision clearly to other people. And then I think you've got to have two other qualities. One is um, you have to be very persistent um, because we usually don't get what we want the first time. Um, and if your vision is pretty complex and um, ambitious, it's going to take a while before you can bring along enough people to see this vision that you have for a rec center or something that you're trying to accomplish. Um, particularly if it's contentious, then I think it takes longer for people to see the vision that you see. And so you just have to be very persistent. You can't just say, okay, that didn't work, I'm going home, I'll never try again. And then I think the maybe fourth and fifth things that are really important uh, qualities are um, the toughest for a lot of leaders. And those are to never be overwhelmed by your own mistakes. If you're taking risks, it is inevitable that you're going to make mistakes. But it is really hard for people who are used to doing well to accept their own mistakes and to be able to say, okay, I learned something there and I guess I won't do that again. Um, but um, often we try to defend our mistakes and those kind of things that are probably not the best um, reaction. I think it's because we are afraid of not being perfect and it really is better just to say, yep, that was not the smartest thing I ever did. That was really dumb in fact and I won't make that mistake again. I acknowledge it. Um, and then the last is that when you're a candidate and after you're in office, you always have a target on your back. And most of the time, I found that it's best to not particularly remember that you have a target on your back. I think it is better just to stay on what I call the high road. I'm too busy trying to figure out how I can get this vision to a reality, to be too worried about anybody who's trying to aim at the target on my back. I think it's emotionally easier to look at the world that way. So this is the point when I asked Jeannie, is, is one of her um, the mistakes is when she did the no vote on a bill I was testifying for <laughs> in the Senate, and she was really the only one, and, and it was unanimous in the House, but not in the Senate. <laughs> I don't remember that. And as far as the campaigning goes, we're kind of moving down the list a little bit, but what about the networking and the fundraising aspect of, you know, sort of making this decision and then what comes next? I'll start this. Um, and it depends on the it depends on which your party affiliation is because each party has a different way of going through this. Um, and, and there are different alliances that you would go after. Um, if you're unaffiliated and you're running for office, fundraising is going to be a real issue because you really don't have an anchor per se. Um, but interestingly enough, in our, in our House district, and it's almost true in our Senate district, we're, we're roughly 30-30-30. So um, once you make the decision that the, I remember Sally Hopper telling me that when she ran for Senate, 16, um, and this was 30 years ago, but when she ran for Senate 16, um, Bruce Benson uh, was her finance chair her, for her campaign. And she said the first thing that he made me do was he made me ask for him for money. And she said that was the most difficult thing in the world to do. I mean, I can do fundraising for another cause or for somebody else, and it's really not hard. Asking for money for me is very difficult. And if you want to run for office, it's like anything in sales. Tupper, you know this. you got to get over it. you just got to get over it. But once you do get over it, and once you embrace the no that you're going to get from certain people, um, it does make you stronger. And 
the other thing about campaign asking for money is as you go through the campaign process, one thing that we haven't talked about is it vets what you believe in. You go through a vetting process where people ask you over and over and over again what you believe in. And so you get, and what's wonderful about that is um, once you've gone through that process of vetting, knowing what you believe in, it's easier to ask people for money. So, and then the next thing you need to do is you need to make sure you follow all the campaign laws and you keep good campaign records. And if you have, if, if you come up to a situation where you could probably do it and it would be ethically okay, um, but there's a gray area, just don't do it. And, and it, as long as you keep yourself as clean as you possibly can, you're going to be in the best shape. Now, the rest of it, when you run for office, say if you're going to run for a House seat or a Senate seat, um, what happened with me is former Governor Owens wrote a letter on my behalf, a fundraising letter, just kick me out, get me going. On the Republican side, it is very unusual for any Republican candidate to ever pay for a campaign manager, they're always volunteer, or to ever pay for a fundraiser. Because um, there are people that can professionally fundraise for you. Um, I don't think that's always true on the, on the D side because I know that the, the, uh, the gentleman that ran for me the first time paid his campaign manager and he also paid his fundraiser. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not unheard of, but it, for a state seat, that's usually not what you want to do. So, and, and then once I got to the point where I'd gone, gone to the point where I was really running in the general election in my first race, um, there was a group of people that volunteered to manage my campaign. So there's a lot of that stuff that you're not going to have to worry about. You need to find yourself a good campaign manager, and you need to find yourself somebody that doesn't mind keeping your financial records because you're not the one that should do that. You're also not the one that should ever be able to sign a check from your campaign. You need to distance yourself from that. We were shocked by the money that came into that recall election. Do you see outside money coming in on uh, a, a little, well, of course, that was state senate. So, and in all this money, I know it's a, it was a special issue, but do you see outside money coming in on, on these levels that we're talking about that y'all are involved with? Yep. Oh, yeah. More and more. If, if, if you Google my name right now, and don't, if you Google <laughs> my name right now, um, you'll see there's a particular interest group that is really mad at me, not because I voted for the gun bills, but because I voted for civil unions. And they are an extremist group that believe that, that um, I should have one opinion on social issues than what I have. Um, and so what they have been doing since about March, February or March, is they've had a national campaign where I show up on their website and they say things about me that aren't true, but you know, you just got to get over it, so what? But they say things that I'm their best fundraising tool they have had in years. Because they tell these stories about me and people from all over the country send money to this group. Um, I've gotten, I've got, I got an email from a gentleman in Coral Gables, Florida, and I apologize this is going to offend you. But he said, um, menopause is the only excuse I can give for you. And then we get into this tirade after that. So yes, outside money is impacting races at a level that is very scary. Yeah. yeah. But you know what, what I'd like to talk about is that when you get your start, you're not going to run for the state legislature probably. Very few people that is at their first office. Let's talk about like the, the RTD board. Yeah, the, the rec district. They always, you know, need good candidates. And I think I think I would rather be on the rec board and make no money than do what what uh, Sherry and Jeannie have to do for thirty thousand dollars a year. You know, I mean because yeah. I mean if you're, if you're on the Evergreen Rec Board and you want to take a two week vacation, you do. You know, and they, and it's it's like your time is really, you know, somebody else is is in charge of it. At that local level, you don't have to, to worry that much about money. You do have to call your friends and ask them for money because if you want to have signs uh, or, or uh, do a mailing, it's not cheap to do a mailing, but that's the most effective thing to do, um, you're, you're going to need some money and you're going to have to ask your friends and neighbors for it. But it's nothing like, like people who are at the state legislative 
level. So, and, you know, Don used the word brutal. Yes, it can be brutal, but I've never known the RTD race to get brutal. You know, so. and, I, and I know that our RTD guy is, is uh, term limited in 2014, and there will be a position open for somebody who, um, you know, who, who's interested in, in public transit. And, uh, you know, and um, I, I think that our, our fire district board, and, you know, of course, you could always like, get the recall deal. You know, I was talking to Jeannie before while we were eating our pizza. I, if it weren't so hard, well, let me let me back up a little bit. If I if it, it, I could easily find out if and if each one of you, if I have your name and your street address, if you voted in the presidential election, because it's all computerized and it's it's on the county um, uh, in the county's database. But these these special district elections are run by the special district. Sometimes, like the the recall was was handled by uh, Cottrell and Collins, I think. But that was that was very unusual. Like the rec board elections, Dick Wolf, the old uh, director, is retired. They, they appoint him as the official elective election person. And so the lists of who voted in those fire board, water board uh, elections are written in the handwriting of seventy-five-year-old election judges, you know, <laughs> and they're all you know handwritten. So it would be very hard to find out. But I'll bet you that those people who mounted that recall campaign against the fire district board had never voted in the fire district election. Well, yeah, from, that, from a county yeah. level, so it, it, it matters. It's just not, and, and the county commissioner races, I've never noticed, like if you want to run for county assessor, I have never known, like, the, you know, the people's personal lives to be exposed to right. things like that, you know? Sure. Yeah, we. <laughs> tend to try to stay out of those social issues because if you look at county commissioner race, we're, we're more of a, of a administrator, uh, more of a CEO, COO type of, 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 of structure. But if you, if you look at the overall county of, of over half a million individuals, we run countywide. We have to reside within a certain uh, district, but we run countywide. And um, when you have a, uh, your, your district is that big, in essence, the entire county, you can't touch everybody. You can't reach out to everybody. So you have to be very specific in looking at precincts. You have to use that data. You have to sort that data because there are areas where you just don't want to go into, depending on what political party you're from, because you will not get a vote. There are some areas where you're safe and other areas that are swing votes. Um, and you have to look and concentrate on those areas but it's when you look countywide for a commissioner, um, it's about one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Okay, is that all? That that's all. Now, that's good. Now, when I ran, I I hadn't had any other elected position, city council or anything. People looked at me and said, "You're crazy running first out of the block for commissioner." I said. Yes, that's true. That's true. But I'm going. I'm going. Good for you. But I'm going, and I went up and against an incumbent, and I out hustled, and I got in, and I was elected. Now, and I've enjoyed enjoyed my time. I'm, I, I signed back up for 2014, and I'm in the process of raising money. So if you'd like to leave me a check, this is yeah. uh, <laughs> you gotta ask. Yeah, I gotta ask. You gotta ask. Yeah. Um, I don't like asking either. But it's very difficult. It's hard enough for county commissioner. But just think about how hard it is if you're going to be the coroner. Who gives money to the coroner <laughs> for a race? That's a countywide race. Yes, yeah, also an unsalaried position. It's salary. It's salary. It's salary. Yeah, it's coroner's salary. Is salary. Oh, oh no, no. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So is. when it you is. look at, you know, it's it's hard enough for a county commissioner to do that. And I put in twenty five thousand dollars for my own money. Okay. So. I put in sixty. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Okay. So, Okay, and we won't go there. <laughs> so, yeah, it, 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 you, know, you can make a loan to your campaign, and you can get paid back after the fact. Sometimes people don't like to bet on a newbie. Once you're elected, then they'll help you pay off your campaign debt. Keep return, that in mind. Return on investment. So that's return on investment. Right. right. I want to make sure someone's there. I, just for the record, I ran for the record three times and never spent a penny. 
Never, never thought I did, but every time I finished third, and I would thank God there was three seats up there. <laughs> <laughs> there was a double medal book. There was like a Linda, whatever her name was, Linda from uh, 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 There were only three on the bottom. No, no, no. But, <laughs> no. And, uh, on the bottom, I never. No, not Linda Ball before. Linda Cheris. Linda Cheris. Yeah, it was Kathleen Cheris. Kathleen Cheris. That's what I thought. Anyway. <laughs> I just don't want you to leave here thinking you gotta spend a lot of money going to something you local. Don't. You don't. Yeah. Just the part, I don't know if Peter raised money. I never did. And he, he raised a little. But I mean, I was know, his campaign manager. You, I mean, you don't have I to. I raised a little. You don't. You don't have to raise money, and it, it's scary though. I mean, that's one of the reasons I said earlier I don't want to get into politics. Is the fundraising part of it is just is hard. I mean, if you don't mind me asking, you started six eight years ago, and you raised how much money did you have to raise? Oh, my! I ended up raising just over a hundred thousand. And the next year will be more fun. It depends on what I'm running for, but yeah. Okay, all right. Gotcha. I mean, it's, it's crazy that kind of money for a, a job where you're getting paid. I think there's a scoop coming. <laughs> okay, let's take about a 15 minute break. Okay, we'll come back. Maybe about and, just uh, 10. Uh, how about 10? A 10 minute break. Stretch, have a drink, use the restrooms, and we'll, we'll continue. <laughs> We're going to move down our list a little bit, maybe combine a couple of questions. We thought we would maybe uh, get into some local stuff and talk about uh, maybe some local political issues and also what makes grassroots efforts successful. I know we are going to get some, some good responses on that because we've got a lot of experience here. And maybe give a little experience, a little example from your experience. Yeah, I'll talk about the grassroots effort. The, the, the starting of uh, the Mount Airy Land Trust of Mall was definitely a grassroots, uh, a grassroots uh, effort. And here's what I wrote. I really did think about this a lot. Me and my, me and my granddaughter. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's all about perceiving some unmet need and having a real passion. You know, that's how it's a my. Uh, overwhelming passion has been land use in, in Evergreen because I think it affects our quality of life more than any, any single thing. You know, you just don't want a bunch of ugly buildings all over the place. <laughs> and uh, it started, speaking of Tony Gramsis, um, are you his neighbor, Sherry? Do you live on Hawaii on, on Drive? No, I, I live in the Witness. Okay, so where, where <laughs> High Lawn <laughs> <where, where> <laughs> Drive meets Lewis Ridge Road, yep. there was this big, you know, some of you are active in the arts community. The, the Evergreen Center for the Arts owned own this land, and they were going to sell it, uh, and I can't remember why. And they were going to sell it to a developer, and the people who, you know, my be one of my best friends, Sylvia Robertson, who lives across the street, it's near where the county shops are. It's just, yeah. just beyond right. there. They're going to put up a whole bunch of, you know, houses all kind of close together, and it's just going to be horrible. And we want to leave this. Is a troublesome gulch? I think it's the head of troublesome gulch. We want to, leave, you know, leave this, leave this alone. And so. Uh, Tony suggested that all the people who live in Highline should pool their money and buy the property. <laughs> you know? That's a good Republican approach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, you know, we could start a land trust, and then the land trust could buy critical areas like that, and then it would be tax deductible. So I had some experience because I actually I, I live near El Rancho and on Ruby Ranch Road. That's in the Clear Creek drainage, and I knew. Um, the people who had started the Clear Creek Land Conservancy, which was which came about after uh, gambling was was permitted, you know, to, to protect the the whole um, the whole Clear Creek Canyon uh, from development. So I had some experience with them, and that's what I I thought about. This is this is what we need to do. So that was a, I had a great passion for this, and and you really do need to have the passion. But you need to build a team, and you can you can only really recruit good, effective people if they know if they sign up with you that you're going to follow through, and that you're a reliable person, and that you do what you say. It's not just somebody with some harebrained idea, but if somebody new. You know, if Linda's behind this, it, she's not disappearing next week. She's she's going to stick it out until it gets on its feet. And actually, I never had a major leadership role in Mom, but I found really good people uh, uh, who. Who would take who would take that that leadership role? I was on the board after after a while, but I was too politically involved when Malt got started, and, and I didn't want to like taint it with uh, anything. I, I wanted to keep it pure of partisan politics, and so I couldn't get personally involved in it. But 
it's it's really a a, a lot about uh, a lot about team building and you know and uh, hitching your star to somebody that you know is gonna is gonna follow through on things. Malt's awesome. Mountain Area Land Trust may not think of me as earlier. Evergreen's a community of volunteers. Mm -hmm. It's run incorporated. Yeah. I don't know what's happened to any of you, but it's happened to me twice since the 30 years I've lived here. Twice I've been up at the uh, local joke getting gas. People go, where's City Hall? I need to rush my car. <laughs> <laughs> it's happened to me twice. And I said, it's down at Golden. Like, no, I, I mean Evergreen. No, no. Born incorporated. If you come from the East, where I did, I grew up in New Hampshire, this whole um, unincorporated scenario concept. concept is very new. I mean, it's a Western mm -hmm. thing. And, um, I mean, the history of Evergreen, as I said, when I kind of introduced myself, when I wrote these names down. I mean, you've got like, uh, oh, what's my little deal? Too much paper. I'm bad with paper. Um, mm -hmm. We had, you know, Bud Clark, Esco. I mean, they, they did, yeah, you know, so they did the building and all the infrastructure with High Wan and the Ridge and Soda Creek, I think, and, and how Davidson, David Service, he's at Howe's, one of the first guys who started the fire district, Walt Anderson, Anderson's Market. It's interesting how Davidson's son, Mark, who now runs Davis Insurance, and Walt Anderson's son, Pete, Pete's a paid fireman for West Metro or whatever, but Mark Davidson and Pete Anderson were very huge in the Evergreen Fire Department way back in the day. And when the Heyman Fire came out in 2002, Mark and Pete were one of the two people who had dropped in there or taken in there. They managed that fire until the feds took it over a day later. Those are Evergreen kids. And it was all about protecting our community and the special districts and all those kind of things. Because, I mean, why this place is called Buchanan Park, because Buchanan family back in the day owned property from here at Idaho Springs, is my understanding. I mean, Hank Alters right. tells that. Yeah. And I live in up there, I live on <coughs> Rosedale Ranch. I run a place on the cabin on Rosedale Ranch, which was the first malt, I believe. The first one was actually Gary Hartsey's <coughs> mint. Yeah. Gary Hart. 200 acres in, in Troublesome Gulch. Yeah, that's, yeah. Always, that's yeah, a yeah, Owens, Owens was right, right up there, was right up there second but or third. I always yeah. laugh, my political hack was on this piece of trivia, but it's always funny that Gary Hart was in Troublesome Gulch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, that's you know, true. The county yeah. can't yeah. keep that yeah. signed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Let me tell you yeah. about no, that. No, it's another story. The most stolen sign in the county. That's a Troublesome Gulch? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, but the special test. And, and, and that's how we got started with all the like special stuff. It was all about grassroots. I mean, even back in the day, because oh, sure I mean, a man think that uh, the Evergreen Metro District, John Ellis could say, the Evergreen Metro District, I think has a second call on the on the water rights for um, for Upper Bear. And, and the thing that's so funky about you know the, the, the rec district, we have 70 square miles, we have lots of open space land, and we have lots of Denver Mountain Park land. That's the big problem with Buchanan Park right up here. When we first got this going, right by the RCD <coughs> level, those trees were dying. It was Denver Mountain Park land. They didn't have a budget to deal with the trees, so the rec district stepped in and said, we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. But back to all this, you know, this, everything, there was a need. And as you said, right. there was a shared need. There was a shared need for water. There was a shared need for fire. Mm -hmm. I think the rec district was incorporated to vote in 67 or 69. 60, 69. Mm -hmm. And Dick Wolf did that as a volunteer. He was an aquatics guy. And Dick Wolf was the executive director for the rec district for what, some 30, 30 years. Yeah. And now he's, he's retired whatever. But... It's all about He's there all the time. Solving, solving, <laughs> solving a need, or I mean, overcoming a challenge or a perceived threat. Mm -hmm. Then I was being sarcastic about the county taking over the policies of Evergreen, but there's no need for us to incorporate until we feel a threat. And then there'll be a grassroots effort. I mean, there's a grassroots effort that I hope doesn't go anywhere about you know, protecting the lake based on all this overuse in this lesson. I, don't, I think that'll fizzle, but I was, I was asked to participate on that committee, and I really don't want to do that. But. Um, it's just, I'm rambling here again, but it's just, this this area has been, the history of the district is it's so important up here. I can't, I can't underemphasize that. It's phenomenal about how we've, bought, bought, you know, bind together, we do these things, and we've done some great stuff in this community. And I, I mean, we, the community, mm -hmm. as Linda, you did a great job with malt. There's a lot of us involved with other things with this and, and other parks and whatnot, but it's a shared need, and, and we have to go out and get money from the county. Now, if only the city, of, only the Conifer could get a rec district. Yes. Conifer. Yeah, you don't always win because it's a good idea. Yeah. You know, I, just, I think Conifer I, likes the fact yeah. that they're recluse a little bit more. They don't want to stuff. Well, it's I don't know. Yeah, pasture people. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Don? You've got some experience with local political issues and grassroots efforts. Grassroots efforts, to me, it's. Yeah. I'm a little more clear cut with my, my engineering background and the way I was raised. My, my dad's an engineer, and I, there has to be a problem and then a solution. You have to clearly define that problem and clearly define the solution, and you have to have a clear message. 
many grassroots, it's kind of nebulous of, well, we would like to try to do this. Well, what are you trying to do? You, people want to have <clears throat> facts. They want to know exactly. If you're going to raise this money, how is it going to be spent? And is it going to be spent on what? And how does it benefit the community? You've heard it multiple times here. Many grassroots efforts that I have seen have been um, targeted towards maybe one small group or an individual of, I want to do this, and trying to get a grassroots effort generated out of a small little area that has very little benefit for the community at large. So look, and how do you get involved, and how do you look at those one, the open space program. That's a grassroots effort through Plan Jeffco. They turn into the open space program. There you go. Look, the entire county. It wasn't, you know, it started with a, a few individuals and has grown into a nationally acclaimed program. It's true. So it's it, very true. It, and so it, you have to look at it. I, I have I have issues and, and and things here that I'd like to do differently and see, but it's not a. It's, a it's not a community-wide issue in grassroots. I have to tell you, I'm trying to start a new grassroots effort here with, with splash collection and processing and how we do composting and how we do all this. October 2nd, <coughs> come on up to come for high school. But um, it, that's grassroots because oh, you have to look at it. Does it, it affects how do we do this so it's, it's budget neutral and it's good for everybody in the county, not just individuals who may live in Conifer and Evergreen, but individuals who live in Lakewood, unincorporated part of Jefferson County, can also take advantage of. October 7th is a weekday. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What time? At night, Conifer High School, 7 p.m. 7 p.m. <coughs> second to the seven. Oh, that's a discussion second. about yeah. slash. Well, that you know that kind of goes a little bit towards the fire. Uh, yes. Because this class is so involved with. So Sherry, talk a little bit about your experience <laughs> with the aftermath <coughs> of the fire. Well, um, it's it, well. You all know that we we ran legislation when that mar it was March 26 last year that the fire happened, and we ran legislation because the state admitted they were at fault, and we were trying to raise the caps. You all know that. Which fire are you talking yeah. about? Oh, oh, I'm North sorry, North Lower North Fork. I'm talking about the Lower North Fork. I apologize. Um, and, and incidentally, the Bluebell fire, I think that was handled the way it was because of what we went through on the Lower North Fork. I mean, I think you saw a huge difference in this last fire season on Jeffco fires because of what we all went through. Um, basically, that has been um, somewhat frustrating because uh, once the Attorney General decided that he didn't want to admit, and didn't want the Governor to admit, the Attorney General is the Governor's um, attorney. Um, and he didn't want him to admit that there was that the state was at fault. That it's now stuck in legalese. Uh, the seven individuals that uh, made claims that there was not a loss of life and there was not extreme property loss, like a lot of people had, uh, those have all settled. And so the last legislative session, we uh, approved about two million dollars to to settle that. But. What I was most amazed about was not anything I did. It was the community of individuals that had been involved in the fire. And, and the core of that community was the Scanlons, Tom and Sharon Scanlon. And I don't know if you know that Tom's a retired Brigadier General in the Air Force. He is. And um, his wife, as a, uh, the wife of a, uh, a military person, knows how to organize people in such an incredible way. Because shortly after the fire, um, I was at um, Conifer High School for a, for a town meeting. And, and by the way, I, I don't know if you all know, Conifer High School has incredible town halls. Or, or Conifer has incredible town halls at the middle school. Evergreen is, is getting much, much better. I mean, the ones that they've had so far have been incredible in the last year. But, but at that first meeting, Sharon Scanlon came up to me, and she already had a spreadsheet of everybody's names, phone numbers, addresses, where they were living, their temporary homes, which is incredible. Um, so I, I think it gets back to what everybody's been talking about. You get, a, you get a core group of people that have a passion, 
and have a vision. And then you get somebody in that group that um, exercises a level of organization and leadership, and that's what goes forward. Uh, the other thing that I think was has not really been uh, noticed with that group, it's been very quiet. Uh, Marshall Zellinger uh, won a, is it a, an Emmy? Yeah, it's an Emmy. He won an Emmy award for his, the, the work that he did in telling the story of the Lower North Fork Fire. And, and I talked to him the other day, and he feels really guilty about it. And I said, Marshall, if you hadn't done what you did with the press, we wouldn't have been as successful as we were in trying to help the people. Um, and um, so it's, it's not resolved, it's not finished, but I know that it will still move forward. Um, I, there were several things about the process that I was not wild about. Um, the interim committee that um, Jeannie and I both served on uh, was to me an embarrassment and an affront to the people of Conifer. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, the press that, that Sharon was able to uh, capture, and she became very sophisticated in the way she was able to deal with that. So if you ever get an opportunity to do any type of a press training, you know, a, a, a public press tra training to talk to news uh, newscasters, take that time because it'll help you show how you should show your message, how you want to deliver that message, and that can be hugely helpful for you. So we'll, uh, we'll go down just a little bit, and Jeannie direct a question to you about um, our number eight and our number nine. What is the decision-making process you use to determine your position in your vote on a controversial issue and have you ever supported an issue that was not popular with your party or your own beliefs? And how did you work with your colleagues on that? It's a loaded question. Yeah. Yeah, it was a tough one. Um, in terms of my decision making process, I like to collect a lot of information before I make a decision. And um, generally speaking, I use. Um, groups that I rely on or um, not so much the internet, but things that I can read about an issue so that I feel like I'm collecting a lot of facts about something, um, not just people's opinions. And um, then it has to go through what I call my own personal filter, which is how does this benefit the people that I represent? Um, so I'm not as interested in which lobbyist group or organization would benefit as I am, how does this work for the people that I work for? I don't think I work for the lobbyists, I think I work for all of you. And so it has to go through that filter and it has to be based on some facts that look to me like they're going to either benefit you or somehow harm you. And um, then I make my decision. I don't make my decision um, typically based on something someone else in my party said, you should vote for this just because I like it, um, isn't good enough for me, I like some data. Um, I think that might be because of my nursing background and the fact that I'm um, educated in the sciences and um, it's just a process that you have to use. Um, you wouldn't want me to just kind of take care of you as a nurse on a hunch or somebody else's <laughs> opinion. You would want me to have some good data uh, that supports why I am um, um, making the deci decisions I am about the care that I want to give you. And um, I would, uh, in the same spirit, also want to know from you, how do you think this affects you? Uh, just like I would as a nurse. Um, and the uh, answer to the second question is no. What was the second question? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, um, Have you ever supported an issue that was not popular with your party? Or your, or or your beliefs. beliefs. Yeah. Really? I do um, that like on a daily basis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that may be um, very true for both of us. That, um, general, I, I think some of it has to do with the fact that um, I was raised in the Democratic Party uh, platform. And so much of my basic uh, principles have to do with some things that are really part of that platform. Um, and so I, it's just 
almost unheard of than on crosswise. Mm -hmm. I have voted on occasion um, against something that most of my colleagues on my side of the aisle voted for, but it wasn't so much because we were at odds with principle at all. It was more because I felt like the um, issue had not been thoroughly thought through and that we needed to take more time to think through that issue before any of us made a decision. And I wasn't willing to say, yes, this is a good idea, until we had done a little bit more homework. And I just felt like we were in a hurry, and um, I don't think it's a good idea to be in too much of a hurry when you're um, passing policy that affects people's lives. You need to really think it through. So but I can only think of that um, occasion once. And, it, the reason I think it stands out in my mind is because it totally shocked my colleagues. It's like they could not believe that I would do that. And it's like, hey, we're, we aren't done. We haven't done all our homework. We need to work on this some more. So, Don, you have to keep in mind as you're governing that only so many people voted for you. And you are still making decisions for so many people that did not. Exactly. I, I just like to add, you, you never compromise your integrity, your morals, and your values. You always keep those true. When you look at deals, there are already, always deal points. There's always compromise points. Um, and I believe that is an art that has been lost um, with a lot of elected officials. And you see too many cases where if you can't get 100% of what you want, they throw in the nuclear option. They blow it up. And they cause a stir. And it's too bad. Because that brings everything to a halt. Um, you know, when you look at the political parties, you look at, at um, you know, I, I'm a Republican. I align my morals and my values and my beliefs line up more with the Republican Party than they do with the, with the, with the Democrat Party. Um, and when you look at deals, we have to, as, as somebody would say, you're, you're elected from the fringes, but you govern from the middle. You, you still have to bring consensus. You have to bring, and you have to listen to both sides. And you have to uh, understand all those issues. And as I said, you, you brought it up, and, and as I, I said to somebody, a whole group of individuals, actually last week when I was talking, in Jefferson County, there are those who voted for me and those who did not but I represent everybody in the county. And I, I want to make sure that everybody understands we're a representative republic. And we don't run our operations, I think it was, who was it? Adams or somebody says, I'm not your delegate. And in fact, we don't go out to vote on every item. We don't go and I don't take what you tell me to do back here on every item and take it forward. You voted for all of us up here, maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't, as a representative of uh, that we would do the best that we possibly do and that you align yourselves with us. And we represent all those, whether you voted for us or not, and we have to make the best decision for the entire community and all those, all those that are within our, our uh, representation. Yes. Can I just uh, uh, piggyback on, the, on the one thing? I, I attended a leadership class sponsored by the Colorado Democratic Party in 1991, and at the time, Roy Romer was the governor, and he spoke to our group. And here's what he said, and this is uh, uh, something that Don said reminded me of this. So I wrote, Roy Romer says, you've got three P's there. You, you've got your principles, you have your policies, and you have your programs. You never compromise your principles. You know, so like you say, we all have, as a principal, we believe in a strong public school system, you know? But what kind of programs, that's where we're gonna disagree. What, what is it that the laws that we pass, the school board actions are gonna influence the, the public schools? And that's where you can compromise, you know? It, it, as long as, it, as everyone remains true to his principles. And I, and I, and I agree with Don completely, that's just gotten so lost that the idea that somehow if you compromise, you're giving up on some essential part of yourself, and, and you don't have to do that. I'm, I'm guessing Sherry's going to say this, but Dr. Whitworth, Rob Whitworth, and you, what's Same. your deal? I can't Same. remember exactly. 
vote your conscience, <coughs> vote your district, you. vote your party. That's why mm -hmm. I that's why I stray from my party so many times in the Capitol because our district is what I represent. I don't represent my party down there. I represent you all. And so it's always an easy, it's never a problem for me. Do you take it on yourself in those situations, Sherry? So you're not necessarily following the party line, but it's a personal belief. Do you feel um, an obligation to express that to your fellow party members? Well, yeah, I mean, before we'll have a big vote, like if I know I'm, I'm going to be against what, like on the civil unions vote, I knew I was, before I was elected, I told people where I was on civil unions. So it, it, it never changed over the, until the day that we finally voted on it and passed out. But I did go to leadership and I said, you know, I'm not going to be with you guys on that one. I'm, and and we'll have a group discussion. We, we have caucus lunches where everybody gets together and, and um, and we'll, I will explain where I am. Um, you know, the partisan nature of what politics are right now, I, I think it's extreme on both sides. And so if you're, if you're, I'm center right, so um, I, I usually am able to get the, the greatest reaction from both sides. So you know that the far right's gonna be angry at me and I know the far left is gonna be angry at me. But the thing that keeps you focused is what everybody's saying. It's who do you represent and what do you believe in. And when I say what I believe in, it's, it's what I believe on and based on my job to represent my constituents. What do I think is the best pe thing for, for HD25, <coughs> Jefferson County, and for the state of Colorado? That's my job. And it's, it, it never, that's the one thing. Uh, John Whitwer, Dr. Whitwer, um, and both Rob, they both told me, if you ever vote on something contrary to your conscience, it's going to wake you up at night. Yeah. And um, I see people do that a lot. And, and it's amazing how you think with 600 bills or whatever we're dealing with, um, and, and I take a lot more votes than that because of, on the Joint Budget Committee we're voting all year round. But it's amazing how you can get into the flow and it's that vetting thing, knowing yourself. The better you know yourself, the better you can you can find your way through those votes. It's really, but you know, and some people in my caucus understand, some people don't, but what's really more important to me is how my district feels. That's, that's where it's at. What about how, um, what you've, not just what you all do, but what you've observed in your colleagues in the governing body that you're part of, about how how you've seen leadership step forward in taking the party or taking a caucus in a particular direction. Any qualities that you've seen or personal experiences that you've seen in other leaders that you've governed with? Well, I think it's the same as I was talking about before. Um, at least in, in my caucus, um, the leadership is very good at uh, clearly uh, having a vision, sharing that with the rest of the members, articulating that very carefully, and um, just staying uh, with that particular vision throughout an entire session so that they're not waffling or uh, changing their minds. They're pretty uh, clear about what's important. And uh, for example, um, President Schaefer, the President of the Senate uh, before John Morris, um, was very passionate about the importance of public education and um, adequate K-12 through funding, and uh, also is strong on preschool programs. And he never changed that position. It was always discussed. It was always very clear how he thought we could get there in terms of adequately um, supporting public education. Um, and um, he never um, would have punished anyone in the caucus for not uh, voting exactly the same way he did, but he was very clear about what he thought was very important. Um, so you knew that 
you were expected to vote based on your own principles, um, but he was perfectly willing to, to point out to you why he thought this was very important and hoped that the rest of us would think it was very important. Linda, you have some? Yeah, I, I did have a, a thought uh, uh, on, the, on that subject. It, it, there's always conflict. You know, I, one of my dearest friends has a bumper sticker that says, conflict is inevitable, violence is not. That, that's her thing. So, you, it, but I, I was talking to Tupper dur during the break. It, part of the reason that it, it's many of us here have pretty long history uh, in politics is that we can have an opponent and see that opponent as being a worthy person and not our enemy. Your opponent is not your enemy. And then, and when I think that the most divisive things for for political people are primaries. And you know, I'm just talking about, okay, Pete, yeah. Everybody, you know, everybody who's really a long time political says, "Oh God, I just hate primaries." And why? Is because that conflict. People don't respect their opponent. They see the opponent as the enemy, and and not as somebody who's who happens to to be running against them. So you know, there there are a lot of you know, we're talking about. We could use Syria as an example here. How'd you like to be a Democratic congressman right now? When, you know, I said to somebody on Saturday night at the Eleanor Roosevelt dinner party, I put my be between a rock and a hard place. Well, I don't think so. And I said, yeah. But what, I said, Here, here's, his, here's his rock. He's got his calls running 100 to 1 saying, don't vote to bomb Syria. And he's got his president telling him how I, how I want you to vote, you know? So, yeah, you, you, get, you get torn. So you've got to really know um, what's inside there. I will just throw in, a, I'm not a candidate though, but I, I got a lot of blowback from a conservative side of the Republican Party. I was very involved with fast tracks. I was the federal lobbyist at the time. I was working for a DC based lobbying firm. And I was working for the, uh, I was hired by the mayor's and commissioner's coalition for Highway 36. And I was doing, I was doing, I was City of Boulder, County of Boulder, Superior Louisville, Broomfield, and I'm forgetting one group. The actors of the game. You know, as a lobbyist, I mean, as a lobbyist for five years, I've been represented level. It was interesting. I represented that group. I represented the uh, Urban Renewal Authority for Colorado Springs. Represented Level Three and Quiz. Those all kinds of different groups. But fast tracks, I believe in that. And I was always told in campaign consulting, it's the mirror test. We're all kind of talking. You got to look in the mirror in the morning and say, you know, are you a dirt ball? Or can you look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm okay. And we all go through that process, and you have me because there's times when you're pushed. And Sherry and I were just talking earlier, and Don about this one group here in town that will name, name, remain nameless. But uh, you know, they found I was working on fast tracks. But Peter, we're subsidizing—that's a subsidy. I mean, well, we're subsidizing everything. I mean, you know, high, you know, the gas tax doesn't pay for highways and anything. But I got a lot of blowback on fast tracks. I still think it's the right thing to do. I'm not sure many people are riding from the uh, Taj Mahal downtown yet, but the point of it is we have those quarters, they're, they're built, no, they're all built, but they're there, they're going to be in the next 58 years, and, you know, I, I go back to Federico Penny, envisioned a great city, and then Wellington Webb came in and was a money auditor guy, got a lot of stuff built, but I mean, I just think you have to basically, you and you two, I mean, you you got to, you know, stand up there and take the flock for your votes. Well, do, you, do you still speak to the people that, who thought you were well, I, I, I a had, traitor or something? I, I get in trouble. Fast tracks. I get in trouble because I'm a color rhino, and I get. Uh, I I've never been called that. Nah. No, 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 no. <laughs> Republican in name only. Ninety-nine percent of you know that. But yeah. what I will say is, is that the Republican the Republican Party is never going to win a statewide election or a national election. They go with a phobia with the social issues. The Republican Party, when I was in my heyday. We were fiscally conservative. That was our brand, right. and everything else was secondary. Yes. Now, the Tea Party people, unfortunately, are hung up on theory, but they're not grounded in reality. So that's probably what Sherry's talking about. These people are making some votes, and maybe they don't believe it, but they're feeling pressure to do that. And at the end of the day, Dr. Weber's thing was, what, what is it? I can never remember. Conscious District Party. That's 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 the way it's got to be because that's the end of the day. You look yourself in the mirror, and that's how you can deal with press and you can deal with people coming up to you. If you believe it, you're okay. But if you get you get you know hoodwinked at a caucus, well, you do this and I'll do that, and then all of a sudden someone really starts pressing you, it's like you you, you look like an idiot or you're not, an idiot. You're not you genuine, genuine. You're not genuine. Yeah. Your cause, and that's something that elected officials face all the time, and it's getting more. I mean. 
I used to do, you know, a lot of lower context stuff, a lot of direct mail stuff like that. The social media stuff, I'm glad I'm not in politics doing that because I mean you can't control that stuff. You want a certain certain degree. Can I tweet you right no, now? No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you, know, you, you, you want to control your message, and you know, and also I mean, you just can't control those things anymore. So again, All right. So, so that kind of goes to we're you know moving on down. How do you explain? And anybody's welcome to jump in here. How do you explain how we have come to today? when we can have a meeting like this and two political parties and really we can agree on probably 80% of the issues that might come up, how has our country come to this place of such partisanship? Can I jump in? Absolutely. Sure. I, I would, this, is, has, this is one of those head scratchers. And my last trip back to it's Washington, as you can tell me, <laughs> 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 but it was deep, but it was funny. I laughed. That was good. That's quick. Um, when you when you look at a recent trip back to DC and in, in talking with some elected officials, some new and some officials that have been there for a long time, long, long time. They, would you see the differences when you were elected back in the? 50s, 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s. 80s had started to change a little bit. You actually were elected back here in the Senate, Congress, you'd go back to D.C. and you would take your family. And everyone else brought their family. Your kids would go to the same school. You would show up at events together and you would talk. Whether you're in the same political party or not, you would talk. you become connected. You would collaborate. You knew that person. Nowadays, what's happening, especially in Congress, I don't know how the congressmen and women do it, having to run every two years, you are constantly on the campaign trail. And what is very typical now, back in D.C., is you leave on a Monday morning, and you fly out to D.C., you grab all your briefing paper from your staffers, you start looking, you go into meetings, you start going here, you run a thousand miles a minute, on Thursday night, you jump on an airplane and you fly home because you have campaign events to go to, you have to see people, you have to hustle, you have to do things. There's no camaraderie. There's no collaboration. It is, this is what I know, this is what I bring, and then I leave. It's in and out, in and out, in and out, and it's, it's really become dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. You know, David Skaggs said exactly that about... 15 years ago, I mean, how long has it been since Davis Gaggs? Davis Gaggs used to represent the 2nd Congressional District, which is mostly Boulder, Boulder County. We are now in the 2nd, but we were not at the time. It was Jeff Go above I-70 and, and Boulder County. And that's precisely what he said, is when the Congress people stopped bringing their families. And, and that's what, what, I, what I put in my notes. I think the reason that people you get along is if you are, even in Dr. Whitmer, you know, you see him, in the grocery store, you yeah. know, you, you, um, with local politics, I think it's not so contentious because people who are on opposite sides of some issue or, or on, in different parties are still in the same church, their kids are still on the same teams, you know, they, they have connections that, that transcend their, their political mm -hmm. party. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I really hadn't thought of that in terms of the national. Uh, issue, but I, but I remember David saying that a long time ago. Part of it too is the the, the, the demand and drive for fundraising is endless. Mm -hmm. And I worked for I I went to work for Bill Armstrong at five hundred dollars a month in nineteen seventy eight as a deputy press secretary for his race. But I died going to heaven making five hundred dollars a month. You know, I was going to be a ski patrolman and ask for my dad with shit bricks that I was doing. You know, and I have a real job. <laughs> and so anyway, but I mean, in nineteen seventy eight, Bill Armstrong was the first statewide candidate to raise raise and spend a million dollars. That was in seventy eight. Eighty four, I was his finance director, was a deputy campaign manager, and a money guy. We raised three million dollars in eighty four. The first race to raise three million dollars in Colorado. And now, Bosch and going hey, Ken Buskin only that's Mark Udall. And 25 million, I think, is what you all got right now. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a 15, 20 million on each side, and, that's, and that doesn't include special interests, and that doesn't include all the other stuff. So the pressure, there's so much pressure to raise money, 
it's a phenomenal. And, and I always said the mice aren't going to regulate the cheese. I mean, there's got to be a way to figure out. I mean, the finding, the fundraising is the hard part. I don't believe in public find, uh, public funding of campaigns, mm -hmm. but it's out of control, and it's unfortunate because the uh, McCain Fine Gold campaign uh, um, campaign spending act, or whatever the heck it was called. What that did was instead of you know, having total accountability, who gave each campaign that created all these special interests in these 527s, and it's worse now than ever. It's just a black hole. No one knows where, where any of the money's coming from, and it's wrong. It's flat out wrong. I mean, when you work for a U.S. Senator, I used to teach, or not teach, I used to do a lecture at CU in this political journalism class uh, once a semester, and this kid said to me, well, you know, when Senator Allard's receptionist is on the phone, and, you know, you got a, a five, you know, millionaire, or constituents, what phone call is he going to take first? And the client said, you know, that's an irrelevant comment because it just doesn't work that way. But it, it, the reality is there's so much money in campaigns and there's so much, you know, pressure to do it. I don't know when it's going to change because I'm really glad right now I don't work for a U.S. Senator or Congressman. I know Ed Pearl went really well and he's a great guy and I, I just, I feel so bad for those guys because it's ugly. It's just ugly time. You know that before we leave this, there's. I was talking to a friend the other day. We were talking about just the politics, and and I, I think you guys are right with everything you're talking about campaign finance reform, how it hasn't, and it's actually made it worse, and the whole idea of seeing your local representative locally. Um, but if you look at the whole um, the dysfunction, the gridlock that's going on in D.C. Um, I think all these things impact it, and it's all part of it. But the gridlock that we've got right now, we had before in the history of the country, in the early part of the uh, 20th century, we had that gridlock. The thing that scares me the most is when we've had gridlock like this at a national level, the only way it's ever broken is with a war. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm most afraid of. I mean, you can trace it back sure. in political history, and yeah. that's the thing that seems to be the only thing that breaks it down. So um, that's why when there's partisanship, that's why when you have people saying bad pe things about people in an election, I will not participate in that conversation because the stakes are too high. And what you start locally like this, it does transmit up. I mean, partisanship, in my mind, is one of the most anti-American. You, you can't, we're destroying ourselves by being partisan. We really, really are. Jeannie, you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I, I think that um, what's been said makes a lot of sense. It's like, uh, if we can't find someone else to fight with, we'll fight amongst ourselves. And um, we, it's something about human behavior that um, allows us to do that. And I think one of the most fundamental um, human aspects of human behavior that um, befuddles me is how important competition is to a lot of people. And it's so important that sometimes we just can't even imagine that all of us could win on some issue instead of that there has to be a winner and a loser on everything. And so we go into almost all conversations with this sort of competitive um, perspective when I don't think that most of the time it would really even be needed. Um, and it creates this divisiveness that then ends up with hurt feelings and more competition and more separation and less willingness to find common ground. So um, I think fundamental to the whole thing is asking ourselves as a culture, when is it appropriate for us to compete? And when is it appropriate for us just to cooperate with each other? And I don't know that we have that conversation often enough. But I think it's really important. Um, when we were serving on the uh, Wildfire uh, Commission, the Lower North Fork Wildfire Commission, um, there were some things that were troubling about how that was handled, but there were also many things that we could agree on because we were on the issue of wildfires, thinking that it made much more sense for us to be 
cooperating with each other. Why would that be a partisan issue at all? It just is simply something we all have to be working on together to figure out how are we going to mitigate these wildfires and how, what kind of resources do we need to prevent us from um, experiencing some of the really catastrophic events that have occurred and just you know getting down to the brass tacks of the slash pile issue that a commissioner can advocate for. Very important. And why is that something you compete about? Um, so um, anyway, I think fundamentally it's really important. But I also think that um, both parties have tended to sort of go to extremes. And that's made it more difficult for us to find some common ground with each other. I tend, um, like Representative Giroux, I tend to be um, more moderate. And for that reason, I'm kind of looking around wondering, what are we fighting about part of the time? When it really looks to me like if we just sat down, got to know each other, sorted this out, we probably could come up with a really good solution. And it wouldn't even necessarily have to be a compromise. A lot of it is just listening to each other and talking. Well, our class has been awesome. Nobody's shouted out one. I think some of you have uh, put some questions. I think some of you have put some questions together. And Lisa, do you want to do you want to handle that? Sure. With Peggy, you go either one. We uh. Last month our module was on natural resources, so I think this is a continuation of this one, but this question's for Commissioner Rozier. Um, which weed do you consider most noxious? Really? <laughs> 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 Which weed most noxious? So yeah, the Canadian thistle. Yeah, the <laughs> <first. laughs> oh, yeah. Um, that is a tough question. Since I'm on the noxious weed board, I should know the answer. You should. We have people for that. I'm sure you can check in your weed book when you go home. <laughs> and next time you'll go. When, and so whenever we do our political process module, you'll be able to um, help with that next month. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have that answer for the class. Okay. Um, another question here is, um, why is the pay so low? We've talked about pay. Uh, it seems like it's a deterrent for good people to run. Any responses? It's all over the board. I mean, state legislators in New Hampshire get paid $100 a year. And they, it's, it's ridiculous. And uh, it, it's, it's just California, it's a full time legislature. I think they may get six figure money. I'm not sure about that. They get quite a bit. Yeah. It's not really a million dollars a year. No, they can't pay for it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, a really, it's a really hard thing in politics to, to vote yourself a pay raise. So, so typically what you can do, you don't think so. I, I, no, no, no. Oh. I ran a bill last year with Claire Levy. We were, we were running a bill to give every... The, the deal was is that our attorney general makes $90,000 a year. The governor makes $90,000 a year. There is a really excellent person that is not running for governor this year, um, specifically because of pay. Yeah. He just can't justify it. And I think it does preclude people. But then you get to the philosophical question of, why do you run for office? You're certainly not going to run for office for the money. No, but you still have a family to support. And yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's like most, we're supposed to be. We're supposed to. Yeah, I know. It's I agree. Trust me. Though, right? Yeah, right. That's well, but it's pretty much destroyed my practice. I mean, um, I. It's difficult. For, I mean, what what client would work with me if you can't count on me for the, you know the whole year? So. Um, we're working on that. I think we're close to doing something. And, and what I think would be smart would be what we wanted to do with this bill, and Pat Steadman was running it in the Senate, is <coughs> to index the pay raise. If you take it out of a voting thing, if it becomes an automatic thing that is, you know, I don't, I don't know what you want to index it to, but um, cost of living, I don't care. CPI, I don't care. But, but index it, and then if we do that, then, then we'll be better off. But it's always going to be a lower <coughs> paid position. But I'm okay with that because that's not why I serve. It but you have a spouse, exactly, right. and your children are grown. Um, so you're saying it's easier for me than it is for somebody else? Mm -hmm. 
Um, actually, I don't agree with that. Okay. Um, because I am 57 years old, and I've gone through the recession, and it has cost me millions. Mm -hmm. And I am still serving because regardless of what I've gone through personally and financially, it's still worth it to me. So I don't think you can say one person deserves money when another person doesn't, or one yeah. person is impacted more than another person is. I think the point is, is you look at the whole thing and you find some medium range and you stick with it. But I do think we need to be increasing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, and it's, it, it's a matter of, of recruitment. You know, like we were saying about, it, you know, you, you know someone who, make a fine governor who just financially doesn't want to make it at 90000 But at least 90000 is a living wage. I don't think anybody thinks that $30,000 is no, a living wage. No, is that like cost? Well, you know? Yeah. We're in poverty yeah. level. Yeah. 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 I would yeah. So, so what you get are independently wealthy people, re retired people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why the Colorado legislature has so many women. Because they're not the breadwinner. I disagree with that, and and I and I have to say that that actually I think we need to not be saying that there are women in there because they're not the breadwinners, because to me that is um, I, I I don't think that's I don't think that's true. Colorado has a lot of women in the legislature because Colorado was a state first state in the country that gave women the vote. Wyoming was the first territory. I think we have always had a spirit of uh, civic involvement with our, the women. I don't think it has anything to do with whether or not the breadwinners are not. Well, I think I think we um, need to raise um, the salaries, not for me personally, but um, because it's difficult to attract people into these positions, even even if they're really well qualified, and that's not really the reason that they're running, I do think that they need to be higher, but I don't think they need to be outrageously high, because if they were extremely high, people might be motivated just because of the salary, and I don't think that's the right motive at all. Um, so I think uh, an increase is appropriate, and you probably have learned this from your leadership class, but one of the things that is a little bit more comfortable about raising the salaries is that when you're raising them, you're not raising them for yourself because it can't apply to the people who are holding office right now. It can right. only apply to the people who are going to be running next. Um, so I think that that's helpful to me because I'm not thinking about myself, I'm thinking about other people. And um, I also think that that's true. We, the legislature, has the authority to um, uh, raise the salaries of the county elected officials also. Yeah. And <laughs> I thought I'd pay attention. Um, and, and I think that it was difficult for us um, to convince some of our colleagues that this was very appropriate to raise their salaries for a number of reasons also. And that it would be reasonable and that we can't have people who are in deputy positions in the counties making significantly higher than their elected official supervise, <clears throat> in supervisor roles like third and recorder um, simply because there's no motive for them to run for these seats or far fewer motive to run for those seats. So I, I think we um, need to grapple with that as well, not just the salaries for ourselves. Um, and for the salaries for the counties, it's all tiered so that a really modest uh, county that doesn't have a lot of revenue, like Jackson County at the moment, doesn't have a lot of revenue. It's on a tier, so they can be at a lower three tier. Three levels, aren't there? There are five, five, I think maybe three. six. I thought it was three. Uh, three. No, I think there might be more than that, Commissioner <coughs> Rogers. I'm pretty sure it's three as well. I don't think so. All right, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I just know the Clear Creek Commissioner, Gilbert County Commissioner, gets maybe a third to 25% of the people. Uh, it's changed, um, and and actually, when I was the county commissioner, we moved from four to three in in, t in the tiers. Um, but you can adjust it based on um, the county's resources, and so then I think it's fair. So, but we do need to have that conversation about increasing the salaries for elected officials so we get good people. What else have you got, Lisa? Um, so, our d uh, and this was touched on a little bit, but um, maybe. Any of you might want to elaborate, but are Democrat and Republican affiliations important at a county level? Mm. <laughs> 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 I, I 
not not as not as um, important as they are at the state or national level. Um, and I think it depends on the county. I think in some counties you could easily win unaffiliated in 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 several roles, but it kind of depends on the political environment <coughs> of that particular county. Like Denver, maybe. Or something. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's, it's changing. Boulder, that would be. Yeah. Yeah. It, if, you, if you look at uh, uh, voter affiliations in Jefferson County, it's a third, a third, a third. So um, in, in the past, it has, your affiliation was a, a determination. Uh, here in, say, Douglas County, um, really, the election happens in the primary. Right. Is it like 70% Republican or 60% Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with Denver, I could say the same thing in Denver. It, it happens in the primary. Or Boulder. Or Boulder. Um, so, in those, yes, definitely, it does. Um, Jefferson County, not so much. And we're seeing a higher rate of individuals who are signing up who are unaffiliated voters than uh, picking a, a political party. Mm -hmm. But what about, excuse me, but what about running for office if you are unaffiliated? If you want to run for office, it's tough. affiliated. It's tough enough. Doesn't happen. Ted Mink did it. Ted Mink is, is, is the last person to do it. That, that, um, yeah. Well, it's, a, it's, it's hard. Uh, it's definitely harder. It's hard. <laughs> it's it's hard. really, really hard. If you're a good candidate and you got, you got something to talk about and you're not a one trick pony and you can, you know, feel the middle, you're good because Ms. Dunn said earlier today, third to third to third, you still have to get that. Consolidate your base with your public member. You got to get that middle ground. Mm -hmm. but, but the, uh, city councils, for example, uh, even the Denver mayor's race—they're not partisan races. Well, that's because uh, everybody's a Democrat there. <laughs> 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 no, but, no, but, but, it, but it's true in all the cities in, in Colorado. Yeah, but to add to that, Linda, they're, 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 they're not. They're not partisan races in the sense that it's not on the ballot, but it is a partisan race. Mm -hmm. It's all—it's all one party that's right. It, it's it's because you can see who supports who and what's going on. I only know of one affiliated uh, individual who who holds elected office, and he's Adam Paul Lakewood, Lakewood City Councilman. Um, but it just because it's not on the ballot as an R or a D or a U or a G or all the other parties that are out there, it, it's a partisan race. I think it's because it's hard to build the organization. If you're an affiliate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's true. And if you were, if you can walk into an organization that's already there, mm -hmm. it's so much easier. So I can imagine in really small rural communities that probably doesn't matter as much, particularly when you don't have to raise a lot of money. You know, just the difference between Don's, the cost of Don's uh, race and mine. I had to raise six thousand dollars to be a county commissioner in a really tiny, one of the tiniest counties in the, in the state with a very small population. Yeah, so, but Jeannie, that's because they had to vote for you. He had to raise more money because they were trying to, he was trying to get them to vote for him. I call Sherry a friend. <laughs> okay, so next question. Um, Commissioner, this one's kind of geared towards you as well, and, and any of the rest of you that would like to respond. How do you see the future of bicycles and cars cooperating in the mountain communities? <laughs> That's a good one. Oh, man, you would have to bring this up. Uh, as many of you know, I, I have spent now two years working on this, on this issue, and I had uh, multiple county meetings, large meetings in different areas. I had one at Lookout Mountain uh, in the Nature Center there. I had one down at the Ken Carroll Ranch House, and then one up here at Buchanan. And it, they were big community meetings because I kept having individuals call on both sides, a motorist and cyclist saying, these crazy people, <laughs> right? <laughs> crazy people, they're all crazy, they're all insane. <laughs> um, they're all clean, it's everybody's right. And it was the, the stereotyping, and unfortunately it's, it, it, it got it got crazy. I have to tell you, it's really easy to kick the can down the road and let somebody else handle it. Um, you talked about the to stand up and to say, "Hey, okay, I'm going to tackle this issue." I had I had multiple people that said, "Leave this one alone. Don't touch it. That's not in my nature." 
So uh, I did tackle it. Then we we had those meetings. We formed um, a study commission, a study group, an action committee. And we chose uh, Deer Creek Canyon as the, the key canyon to look at and to say, okay, that's where most of the complaints come from. <laughs> Tell you what, most of the accidents happen in the urban core. Okay, urban intersections, arterial, arterial. That's where all the accidents happen. That's where all the injuries happen. Um, in mountain roads, comparably, very little. Um, that's but, where the hostility happens. Yes. <laughs> that's where the phone calls come that's from. Where the tax, are. I have a truck to run tax and glass <laughs> and this <laughs> and that. <laughs> so um, what we did is we, we, like I said before, what's the problem, what's the solution? In Deer Creek Canyon, it was meeting with residents. It was meeting with the cycling community and say, okay, what's, what's one, two, and three? Let, let's try to buy off something that we can actually complete. Number one, public urination. Yeah. Number one issue, public urination. Yeah. Number two, stopping your bikes in the street, causing a traffic jam and or a dangerous situation. Number three, enforcement, not only for the motors, but for the cyclists. Okay? You still have to obey the rules of the road if you're on the bike. So we tackled those. Um, we looked at uh, the canyon, and we... we didn't try to take all the county at once, but we could use it as a test case and say, okay, we're going to take Phillipsburg, which is where most cyclists stop, they either go to high grade or they continue up Deer Creek Canyon. Mm -hmm. That's where they stop. We are going to provide them with a pullout so that they can stop safely. They can hydrate. They can wait for their friends. They can figure out the way to go. And we're going to put in a porta potty. <laughs> okay? And not only that, but then put in a, a trash receptacle. We're also working on signage and striking. Okay? We are doing this as steps, and we are saying, okay, let's see if this works. If it works, let's duplicate this elsewhere. Let's, let's not look at this grandiose project where it's just it's so all-encompassing and it just fails, day one. Let's look at it, let's take what works, duplicate it, what doesn't work, let's not do it, and move forward. And so far I've received um, some, some good support. I have others that just say, no way in heck. Why, why support those crazy cyclists? Don't do anything for them. And then other cyclists say that it's not enough. But it's something. Because some, nothing has been done, at least in Deer Creek Canyon, for 17 plus years. Well, it was, it was the problem was impacted by state legislation that Greg Brophy and Andy Kerr ran a few years ago. Yeah. And that was a problem because one of my first, well, when your predecessor was in office, I was up having those same meetings with Mike Cobb yeah. and Kathy and I. And and you're right. It, and, and I'm surprised you didn't mention drafting in there because it's when, when the cyclists draft behind the, the oh, trucks. I'm just sure somebody's going to die up there. I it just it, it just it scares me so much. But I mean that's that's an excellent question, and you're it sounds like you're making better headway than has ever been made, which surprises me. <laughs> Well, there was Do you a have lot a question on why Sherry is attacking yeah. Don's? <laughs> Such good friends. I will say that at the, the last race, the last mountain race, there was a lot less negative publicity and no word of tax being dropped and glass and those kinds of things. It seemed that it was a little bit more accepted. So I don't know if that's a result. Once again, we get everybody together, and that's what I saw in the main meetings, we had people come in there that were loaded for bear. I mean, they were going to go at each other. And after we talked, after we went through the process, I had individual after individual walk up with their speech, mm -hmm. throw it down on the floor, and say, wow, I learned so much. Wow. Thank you. I'm going to work with you all. Mm -hmm. And it's getting people together to understand both sides and, and to work it out instead of this divisive nature that we see everywhere. Um, the other thing I, I would point out is that rather than rather than coming up with a punitive approach, you actually came up with an approach that provided benefits for the cyclists 
that would solve the problem. So it didn't hurt anybody. And I think we often tend to sort of go with this punitive approach. And then there's too much pushback from that. This was a really great way to resolve that issue. Thank you. We already have enough rule threads on the books. This was looking at a solution that would not add capacity to the node. It would not only help the cycling community, it would also help the motorists. Right. Because I know if I was driving down on my truck and I hit somebody and I killed them, I'd feel absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, even if it's their fault. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's still. So it, it's, it, it's help, trying to help both sides. And um, I hope it's successful. <clears throat> Anything else? I think that's a good note to... Anybody else have any quick questions that you just thought of? Amendment 64, marijuana, anything good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that's what she meant when she wanted to ask you, what is your most nauseous weed? <laughs> 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 about politics and you you did a really We rose about partisanship. Thank you. About yes. partisanship. Because yes. yes. there's a difference. And boy, Everything is political. Yeah. yeah. This was this was wonderful. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. House cleaning and, and, and uh, wrapping up. The Peggy's going to do with us. So thank you from me as well. And uh, you have planted seeds in leaders of this community that will blossom into all sorts of good works in the future. Potentially some votes as well. is our final module before this class graduates on the 7th of November. So it is on the 24th of October. It is an all-day affair. We'll see Mr. Rozier again uh, at the, uh, Jeff it's the Jefferson County module. Uh, you will go to the Taj Mahal, to the county courthouse, uh, to the commissioner's conference room, we will begin with breakfast with the district attorney. We'll take a tour of the jail. We will listen and have a conversation with Judge Barry Hill, who has been a long-time supporter of uh, Leadership Evergreen. Uh, we will get a tour of the voting area, voting. Clerk and recorders, really. Clerk and recorders, OK. Oh, we have a specific. Um, voting uh, elections department if they're not in the college. And we'll be touring that prior to our two-hour meeting with all the commissioners from 2 to 4. Uh, and we'll close at 4.30. So this is a very powerful module, as they all are, and we look forward to uh, seeing you all there. As a follow-up to this module, as you have in all other modules, uh, Cliff will submit some survey questions. Uh, you'll get an email saying that the survey has gone out and to please um, comment so we can make next class's um, political process module even stronger. And I think that we can't do that, but this group has come up with um, class projects that I thought could never have been done. So I know that we can always improve. So those survey questions are very important. One thing I would like to point out is if for any reason you're late to a module or you didn't hear one of the, um, one of the speakers, Please not to judge that speaker in the um, mm -hmm. in the survey because that could skew uh, the results. So, uh, but I think everybody's been here for this whole module. And six of you have not completed the survey from last month's module. So, if you haven't, please do so. That that really gives us great. Um, 
planning for the future. I know who you are. I know who you are. Congratulations. Congratulations to your class for your attendance this year. In, in, not just tonight, but in almost every module, 100% attendance. So we, as a board, we really appreciate that. Well, we appreciate all the awesome modules. I mean, I learned so much about this area. Well, you can appreciate Cliff for this one. Yeah.